Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's briefing, Strengthening and Modernizing the Public Health System. I am Devin Lara, Program and Research Associate at the Alliance for Health Policy. For those who are not familiar with the Alliance, welcome. We are a nonpartisan resource for the policy community dedicated to advancing knowledge and understanding of health policy issues. Today's briefing is generously supported by the Commonwealth Fund. You can join today's conversation on Twitter using the hashtag AllHealthLive and join our community at AllHealthPolicy as well as on Facebook and LinkedIn. Today's panel has a Q&A section at the end of the hour. We want you all to be active participants, so please get your questions ready. You should see a dashboard on the right side of your web browser that has a speech bubble icon with a question mark. You can use that speech bubble icon to submit questions you have for the panelists at any time. We will collect these and address them during the broadcast. Throughout the webinar, you can also chat any technical issues you may be experiencing and someone will attempt to help. Now I'm excited to introduce Rachel Nuza. Rachel is Senior Vice President for Federal and, Federal and State Health Policy at the Commonwealth Fund. Rachel works closely with policymakers at the state and federal level and is responsible for developing and implementing the fund's national policy strategy. In addition to leading the fund's federal and state policy program, she oversees the fund's work on COVID-19 and public health modernization and co-leads the fund's behavioral health focus area. Rachel has over 20 years of experience working in health policy at the federal, state, and local levels of government, as well as in the private sector. Rachel, welcome. We're so excited to have you here with us, and I will turn the stage over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Devin. Thanks so much to everyone at the Alliance um, and for all of you for being here with us on this really gorgeous day in Washington, D.C. Um, we are here today to talk about a really critical issue, how to stabilize and strengthen our nation's public health system, both for current and future pandemics and public health emergencies, but also for everyday public health challenges facing our nation. As Devin said, I'm Rachel Newsom. I'm the Senior Vice President for Policy at the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, the fund is a 103-year-old foundation that supports independent research on healthcare issues and makes grants to promote better access and affordability, improved quality, increased equity, and greater efficiency in healthcare. The COVID-19 pandemic exposed long-standing weaknesses in our public health system. We saw fragmented patchwork of public health laws, regulations, data systems, and governance, and we saw how those were able to hinder our ability to effectively and efficiently respond to public health threats and to carry out core public health functions. In response to the pandemic and given the resulting policy window to consider public health modernization, the Commonwealth Fund formed the Commission on a National Public Health System, chaired by Dr. Peggy Hamburg and staffed by an expert team led by Dr. Josh Sharkstein. The Commission produced a set of actionable policy recommendations released this past June. The Commission recommendations fell into four broad buckets. First, the need for coordinated federal leadership. Second, enhance, um, enhance support for states, local territories, and tribal efforts in exchange for enhanced accountability. Third, better coordination between the healthcare delivery system and the public health system. And finally, building community trust or, and or rebuilding community trust in particular communities. All of these issues will be discussed today, and I'm so grateful to have our esteemed panelists join us. Their full bios are included in their webinar materials, so I'm not gonna take a lot of time to go through them. First, we'll start with Dr. Erica Martin. She's the Professor of Public Administration and Policy at the University of Albany, SUNY, and a faculty fellow at the Center for Collaborative HIV Research and Practice and Policy, as well as the Center for Technology and Government. She directs the Coalition for Applied Modeling and Prevention a multi-institution academic consortium funded by the CDC. It's dedicated to creating models that improve public health decision-making at the national, state, and local level. Exactly what we The 14th Assistant Secretary for, the health, for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from 2009 to 2014. He serves on a number of boards, including the Journal of American Medical Association, or JAMA, 
the Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America, the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, and the Network for Public Health Law. We also have Dr. Jonay Khaldun, a nationally recognized healthcare ex executive, health policy, and public health expert, who currently serves as the Vice President and Chief Equity Officer for CVS Health. Prior to CVS, she served as Chief, Chief Medical Officer for the State of Michigan and Chief Deputy Director for Health in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She oversaw public health, Medicaid, behavioral health, and aging services, and served as the lead strategist guiding Mich the Michigan governor's uh, COVID-19 response, and was appointed in 2021 to the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Finally, we are also lucky enough to have Dr. Caldeun on the Commonwealth and Com Commission on a National Public Health System. Next, Ms. Denise Octavia Smith is the founding executive director of the National Association of Community Health Workers. Denise leads national advocacy on community health worker capacity and exploring their roles to center community voice and drive equity and strengthen public health response during the COVID-19 pandemic. She's contributed to national initiatives and research to integrate community health workers into the ACA marketplace and during COVID-19, improve trust and communication between providers and patients on cost and value and treatment options. Finally, we have Dr. Andrew Baysmore, who serves as the Senior Vice President of Research and Policy for the American Board of Family Medicine. Dr. Baysmore is responsible for managing all research functions and staff development and developing national and international collaborative research partnerships. He serves on the faculties of the Departments of Family Medicine at Georgetown University, Virginia Commonwealth, and the University of Toronto. He continues to see a continuity panel of patients at Fairfax Family Practice Centers and to offer regular global health service in rural Honduras and Guatemala under the banner of Shoulder to Shoulder. Each panelist will provide up to 10 minutes of comments and then we're gonna open it up for an interactive Q&A session. Um, I told you this is an all-star panel. Um, we're so fortunate to have all of you join us. So thank you again to our panelists. Thanks to our audience and Dr. Martin, we're gonna start with you. Please go ahead. Wonderful. Good afternoon. Um, it's, I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this important panel. Next slide. Next slide. Great. So to kick off this panel, I'll provide a high-level explanation of the public health system, followed by some priority areas if we want to modernize the system. Next slide. There's a common refrain that when public health works, we're invisible. And there's another great expression I like that public health is always the bridesmaid and never the bride. The public health system comprises 3,000 local health departments and regional offices, 59 state and territorial health departments, tribal health departments, and federal agencies such as the CDC. And these agencies work closely with diverse community partners, including healthcare, social service organizations, law enforcement, public libraries, and many more. During the COVID pandemic, public health was suddenly in the spotlight. The news media was covering contact tracing, mass vaccination clinics, and guidance on quarantine and isolation periods. But that is a really small sliver of all of what public health does. More broadly, public health agencies promote policies, systems, and overall community conditions that enable optimal health for all. They seek to remove systemic and structural barriers that have resulted in health inequities. And they do this in the areas of assessment, policy development, and assurance. Next slide. And public health practices have evolved historically. So during the initial public health 1.0 phase, public health became an essential governmental function. And activities included sanitation, food and water safety, vaccine development, and basic epidemiology. During Public Health 2.0, the mission expanded, and there were efforts to strengthen public health capabilities and have accountability. And um, in the current Public Health 3.0 era, uh, we're trying to broaden public health practice beyond traditional governmental public health agencies. So we're emphasizing cross-sectoral collaboration to address the social determinants of health, and this framework also defines a role for chief health strategists to drive collective action within communities. Next slide. 
Um, so the COVID pandemic exposed some critical vulnerabilities in our public health system. And I'll talk next about six different priorities to modernize our system. Next slide. So first and foremost, we need sufficient and stable funding. We spend more on healthcare per capita than any other nation, yet we rank pretty low on indicators such as life expectancy. Typically, only two to three percent of our healthcare expenditures go towards public health. We had an influx in funding for COVID, and this fits a historical pattern of funding increases during time of crisis, which are later clawed back after the crisis is no longer a priority. This funding instability constrains our ability to develop strong infrastructure and a stable workforce. Additionally, how we fund public health activities is inefficient. Funding streams are typically earmarked for specific diseases or activities, and this siloed approach is inefficient because many health conditions have similar underlying causes. Removing these funding silos could help us better integrate services and staff to more effectively address population health priorities. And finally, allocations are not proportional to need. As an example, obesity-related funding has remained flat despite rises in obesity rates. Next slide. A second critical area is the public health workforce. The de Beaumont Foundation documented a 15% decline in the governmental public health workforce from 2008 to 2019. And they estimated that providing basic services would require an 80% increase in FTE positions in state and local health departments. Additionally, workforce retention is critical. Prior to the pandemic, Approximately one-fifth of the local public health department workforce considered leaving their position in the next year for reasons other than retirement, and nearly half were planning to leave or retire within five years. During the pandemic, threats and harassment of public health officials has led to resignations and leadership gaps. Fifty-six percent of public health workers report at least one symptom of PTSD. Many of the new public health jobs are specific to COVID and they're not long-term positions. There are also several important workforce training gaps. The highest self-reported training needs are budgeting and financial management and systems and strategic thinking. I also see data analytics and data visualization as additional priorities. And finally, it's important that our workforce, all the way from the line staff, all the way up to leadership, represents the diverse populations that we serve. Next slide. Strategic cross-sectoral cross partnerships are needed to generate impact. And this slide just briefly highlights a few examples of local health departments that collaborated with local libraries, correctional facilities, business owners, and other entities to deliver public health services, such as blood pressure screening, STI testing, and naloxone training. Next slide. Prior to the COVID pandemic, there were already calls for enhanced public health surveillance. The Council for State and Territorial Epidemiologists published an important white paper that envisioned a public health data superhighway that would have automatic interoperable data exchange. But the pandemic highlighted our vulnerabilities in information technology. Currently, the CDC has more than 100 siloed public health data surveillance systems. 30% of local health departments have no interoperable systems, and 38% have partially interoperable systems. And local health departments commonly use paper records to store both clinical and non-clinical data. The CDC currently has a data modernization initiative, and it's, it's promising, but technology is frequently the easiest part of implementing a large IT project. So modernizing our public health data systems is going to require sustained commitment, funding, and leadership, particularly long after COVID recedes. Next slide. Ideally, we want to use our data for action. 
we need to leverage our data to monitor trends in real time so that we can have faster responses. We should mo move beyond reporting process measures and grantee reports towards more rigorous evaluations of programs and policies. And these data and metrics are also critical for quantifying the value of public health investments and improving transparency in what we do to the public. Related to the use of data, continuous quality improvement is important. There is a national voluntary accreditation process that is now in place, and this is designed to help health departments enhance their capabilities and implement quality improvement initiatives. And over the past decade, approximately 350 health departments have become accredited, and almost 400 are currently in the accreditation process. And this is a promising trend that I hope will continue, although this is challenging right now, given the competing priorities of responding to both COVID and now monkeypox. Next slide. And my last recommendation is the need for funding to conduct high quality research on public health services and systems. Public Health Services and Systems Research, or PHSSR, is a subfield of health services research that addresses important issues, including the public health workforce, public health data infrastructure, cross-sector collaboration, and the return on investment for public health services. However, PHSSR has no stable federal funding. These studies have been primarily funded through foundation grants, and the federal funding for PHSSR that was promised in the Prevention and Public Health Fund has never really materialized. So all of our efforts to reimagine our public health system in the wake of the pandemic are not going to meet their full potential unless we can get the scientific evidence to guide the system's performance and demonstrate its value. Last slide. Next slide. Um, so in summary, these are just my, my six recommendations to strengthen the public health system, and I look forward to hearing from our other panelists. Thanks so much, Erica. Um, now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Cope. So thank you so much, uh, Rachel, and welcome everybody. It's great to be part of this panel. I wanna thank the Alliance for hosting this very important national webinar. I, I wanna thank my panelists who are a very impressive group of people and I look forward to the conversation. Uh, and most important of all, I wanna thank all of you for spending your valuable time today to listen to this absolutely critical topic for the future of our country. So I'm going to make my comments quite personal because I'm a physician who has cared for patients for 30 years, but I've also had the extraordinary life experience of being in the trenches for a number of national public health emergencies at the state and federal level. And so what I'm about to share are some of my personal reflections along the way uh, leading up to the present time. So I'm going to start with 9-11 and anthrax, which is over 20 years ago, which I can't believe. But on that day, 9-11, I was the state public health commissioner for Massachusetts. I uh, will never forget the terror that engulfed the country back then. Almost 3,000 people died on that day, as you all remember. And then anthrax engulfed the country for the rest of that fall. Uh, it was a time of bioterrorism, something that no one ever expected. And I remember being uh, one of many public health leaders across the country that had to mobilize some kind of coordinated response among both conventional and unconventional partners. Uh, we worked closely with hospitals and community groups, of course, but also with fire, police, emergency services, very importantly, the postal service that was engulfed with mail with white powders, a tremendous terror across the country. And I'll never forget thinking that probably our most important role back then was effective risk communication. How do you tell people what you know in a time of great uncertainty? How do you try to communicate some sense of calm uh, in the midst of so much terror and fear? 
And then how do you assure a public that a public health system is working for them? So when it was all over, from anthrax, five people died, but millions more were terrorized. Public health turned and pivoted and focused much more explicitly on emergency preparedness, and we all vowed it would never happen again. So there was much attention to public health preparedness then, but over time it faded away. And that leads me personally to June of 2009 when I joined the Obama administration as US Assistant Secretary for Health. And wouldn't you know it, when I started, the whole of federal government and state government was planning for the H1N1 pandemic that we knew was to come that fall. I'll never forget the intensity of that time, how literally everybody in government including health officials, but well outside of the health realm, work together to plan two simultaneous vaccination campaigns for the whole nation that fall. Uh, we were very fortunate that a vaccine was in the works. Uh, we were able to implement those vaccine campaigns in the fall. It was bumpy and not easy. Uh, we would like to think, though, that we had some kind of whole of government approach. And when it quieted down in the spring of 2010, we had unfortunately about 20,000 deaths. But in hindsight, the pandemic back then was not as serious as uh, we feared. So again, the, the theme of the need to be prepared came up for the whole nation and everyone vowed that we had to do better. And then since then, you know, we've had many regular indications that we have to be prepared all the time and have the best, most sustained efforts ready to go at any given time. We had the MERS threat in 2012, Ebola in 2014, Zika in 2015 and 2016. So when COVID started in January, 2020, uh, we all asked ourselves, what's gonna happen here? Are we prepared? And I was one of many who was being asked by the press, how many people might die? We were reminded that in the last major pandemic in our country in 1918, 675,000 people died. But I don't remember anybody in the country predicting back then that we would far exceed that number. And you know that we have now well over a million people in our country who died from COVID-19. That's just absolutely unfathomable. Now, some may say, okay, the country was one third the population a century ago, ago than it was now but no one is finding that 1 million number acceptable. And how do you explain that? Uh, to make this history very simple, in my view, over the last century, our country has invested billions in hospitals, ICUs, ventilators, pharmaceutical drugs. That's very important, that's critical, but we have invested relative pennies in public health and we have not sustained it. So the fundamental issue today and going forward is how do we build a more sustained, committed effort to fund public health and especially disease prevention across the board, whether it's for pandemic threats or everything else? Because I like to summarize the crisis we're in now as the fact that we have a fast pandemic that's fueled by a slower pandemic of preventable chronic conditions, obesity, tobacco addiction, heart disease, lung disease, and the list goes on. We have to rebuild public health from the ground up. So let me re-emphasize some of the themes that Dr. Martin uh, put forward to you. Uh, first, data and surveillance. Has it struck anybody uh, that through the last two and a half years, as COVID progressed, with er every variant, we were surprised. When the Delta variant came forward to take over the country, we were surprised. When the Omicron variant erupted, we were surprised. And now we're wrestling with all the, with all the sub variants of Omicron. Uh, we've had very little genomic sequencing until relatively recently. Fortunately, the CDC has been able to ramp up that capacity uh, lately, and they have a forecasting unit. But why are we always surprised about the threats that we know are always going to be in front of us? Uh, I often like to think about the famous hockey player, Wayne Gretzky, who was interviewed at the end of his career, and they asked him, why were you so successful as a professional athlete? You're not that big, you're not that strong, you're not that fast. And his answer was simply, I skate to where the puck is going, not to where it has been. 
And in my view, one thing we desperately need for public health is an intelligence system that is skating to where the puck is going and not to where it has been. Has it struck anybody on this webinar uh, that in the defense world, that when Russia invaded Ukraine, everyone knew when that was going to happen down to the day almost and the president was telling us that and that's because we've invested so heavily in national intelligence and defense why don't we do that for these other threats especially one that has killed over a million people in our country so far and then secondly the workforce is a major major issue that we need to pay attention to we're desperately concerned about the burnout for healthcare workers and hospitals but also public health workers everywhere. Uh, these workers, in my view, are heroes. They've worked with communities, schools, businesses. They've advised on masks. They've staffed labs. And of course, they've coordinated heroic vaccine efforts. Uh, we now have over 600 million doses of COVID vaccines that's been administered in the US alone. So behind every dose administered is a public health worker who helped make that happen. So that's the good news. But one of the many, many challenges, as we all know, is we have vaccine hesitancy, we have vaccine resistance, we have a lack of trust, and our full vaccination rate right now is uh, 68%. Some may say, gee, that's pretty good for something that's never been tried before. But on the other hand, if that were 78% or 88% or 98%, maybe we wouldn't have over a million people dead from COVID. Uh, right now, we are looking for funding and congressional support to rebuild public health. Uh, through the American Rescue Plan, some 2.9 billion has, has been dedicated specifically for rebuilding global public health infrastructure, but we need to track that carefully to see how much of a difference it makes on rebuilding the workforce and improving pay, and also promoting very important things like a student loan forgiveness program that ASTHO and NACHO are trying to advance. Uh, as Erica mentioned, we're very concerned about the environment for the working public health professional in terms of harassment and threats. Uh, in terms of funding, we should all know that despite the money from the American Rescue Plan in fiscal year 2021, Congress overlooked some $65 billion in pandemic proposals. In fiscal year 22, they overlooked $22 billion. And now we're in debates on fiscal year 2023. And my concern, uh, having lived through this for the last 20 years, is that we're in another cycle as the threat starts to fade away, that people will, lo will lose attention until the next one is on the horizon. We need more funding for the workforce, for data, for surveillance, for the stockpile, for global vaccinations to address inequities and to sustainably fund public health going forward. And again, if we're looking right now at the response to monkeypox, which is finally starting to go down, I mean, that response was slower than anybody would have liked. We're starting to see uh, some cases of polio in New York State. That's a great concern. We have a flu season upon us. And so as I finish, I want to say that the state level and at the federal level and the global level, we have to do more. Uh, back at the state level, I am impressed that some states have really taken up the mantle to really have very thoughtful, on the ground, collaborative, comprehensive planning for the future. Uh, I'll give you one state that has impressed me, and that's Oklahoma. I have the pleasure of advising that state, and they have all the stakeholders around a table trying to plan for the next number of years. Very importantly, they have private business around the table, and we need all sectors of society uh, to work together to prevent the next threat when it's gonna come sooner rather than later. My final comment is that the challenge of public health, as has been alluded to already, is it has to do with disease prevention. And when prevention works, absolutely nothing happens. But I like to say that when prevention works, absolutely nothing happens except the miracle of a perfect, perfectly normal, healthy day. And we have to get that message out so that people realize that this slow return to normalcy that we're hopefully enjoying right now will last and that we could have a much healthier future going forward. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Code. That was that was terrific. And I think a perfect setup for our next speaker. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Khaldun. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on this really important panel. It's just an honor to be here amongst other uh, esteemed uh, public health uh, colleagues. So as was mentioned uh, earlier, I currently lead the efforts to advance health equity at CBS Health. And so our mission at CBS Health is really to quite simply help people on their path to better health and to make healthcare particularly more personal and more accessible. And I'll tell you, as a healthcare uh, innovation company that touches over 100 million people every single day through our, our retail offerings, our, our pharmacy, insurance, our clinical management services as well, I truly believe we have a real opportunity to improve the trajectory of health in this country and at scale. And for me, my, my backgrounds in, in public health and governmental public health leadership especially, and I'll tell you now, being at CBS Health and being at a company that has this uh, scope and scale to improve health and public health is, is really, really exciting. So as was mentioned, I, I have uh, spent the bulk of the last decade really leading uh, public health responses and particularly at the local uh, and state level as chief medical officer in Baltimore, as Detroit Health Commissioner most recently uh, in the state of Michigan. And as it was noted, it was also an honor to be a part of the uh, Commonwealth Commission on a National Public Health System. And so today I really wanted to share some of my um, really specific on the ground experiences as a state and local health official as it relates to uh, public health response and particularly around uh, infrastructure. And so as it relates to public health uh, response, I really found uh, in my, again, over a decade of experience that there are really three key areas where as a country, I think we lacked the infrastructure to advance public health goals. One, and again, I, my, my colleagues have already touched on this, and I know we will further um, in our conversation, but staffing, a lack of critical staffing in key positions. Uh, number two, services, so a lack of timely and sufficient coordination of very basic uh, clinical and, and laboratory services. And then data, which has already been touched on, a lack of an integrated, uh, timely, and robust uh, data infrastructure. And as, as was noted, I, I think you know, these challenges were well known uh, in the public health community well before the pandemic hit. And I do believe that these, um, this lack of infrastructure really contributed directly to a less than ideal uh, pandemic response. But I wanna be very clear, it also resulted in people unnecessarily dying. This is not about theory. This is not about people complaining because they want more money. This is about people's lives, mothers, fathers, daughters, sisters, teachers, et cetera. And so it's really, really important when we think about this, this work and what we need to do to improve the public health system that we think about this as, as people's lives. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, those three areas around staffing services and, and data. And so uh, because of the pandemic, people now, if you didn't know before, now you do know the importance of basic functions like epidemiology, uh, and contact tracing. Again, this, this is really the, the bread and butter function, one of the bread and butter functions of public health to understand how diseases are evolving and impacting communities, and then to respond in a timely manner to prevent spread. Again, we all now, because of COVID-19, understand how important that is. So at, at the beginning of the pandemic, and, and I've lived this, many health departments actually had no epidemiologists, uh, the epidemiologist in some instances at the local level was also the director of the public health department or health departments, especially at the local level, were sharing uh, epidemiologists across multiple cities or counties. And quite frankly, we simply had insufficient staffing to be able to effectively contact trace. Again, something we know is, is really important. And again, this was well known uh, prior to the pandemic and, and certainly resulted in uh, insufficient response. So sustained investment at the national, state, and local level in public health staffing is, is necessary, not just for pandemic response, but also, as Dr. Cole mentioned, for the multiple public health crises and threats that face our country, whether it's opioids, chronic disease, or maternal mortality, et cetera. 
So moving on to services. So when it comes to clinical services, our laboratory infrastructure is antiquated and insufficient. I, I first, I remember seeing this in really my first days as uh, in Baltimore as the chief medical officer for the city where I was investigating a possible measles case. And it was absolutely appalling to me that at the city level, we had to send a laboratory sample all the way to Atlanta to the CDC for processing. And I, as the chief medical officer for the city, had absolutely no idea who was running that sample or when we would receive the result or who to call to actually obtain the results. So I recall just sitting there wondering, okay, I'll sit here. I know there's a potential threat. I have no idea what to do, when to expect a result. And we had no significant laboratory capacity at the local or even state level. So fast forward, um, chief medical executive for the state of Michigan leading that state's response. When COVID-19 hit, my team at the state laboratory in the state's capital, one of the most, I'd say, developed and accomplished state laboratories in the country, actually, we had no capacity to run any uh, samples to test for the virus. And the CDC, as you all may recall, had very limited capacity. And so the direct result of that was that we had overly strict testing requirements early in the pandemic, which many of you may recall. And this directly resulted in uncontrolled spread of the virus. And I can tell you, I'm still, I'm a practicing emergency medicine physician. Respiratory illnesses have a spectrum of presentation from mild to severe. And if you are only testing people and only allow capacity to test people who are severely ill or who recently traveled, you will never be able to sufficiently identify or contain a respiratory illness. And so right there, in the very beginning of this pandemic, our lack of a robust and coordinated laboratory infrastructure and the lack of the ability to quickly scale testing capabilities for an emerging virus contributed directly to insufficient clinical policies for testing and uncontrolled spread of COVID-19. And as we all know, uh, way too many lives lost. I'll also note here, this really was an example, is an example of the importance of public and private partnerships and particularly the important role that pharmacies can play. So CVS Health, they were in fact a great partner to me in the state of Michigan and were critical across the country in helping to provide not just testing, but also vaccination and therapeutic capacity across the country and particularly in underserved communities. And those types of partnerships, as we think about our public health system broadly, those types of partnerships really need to be strengthened and supported. I'll tell you, it's estimated that there's a pharmacy located within five miles of 90% of people residing in the United States. 70% of pharmacy testing sites for COVID-19 are in areas with moderate to high social vulnerability. And a recent CBS Health survey actually found that 43% of people intend to visit a retail pharmacy to get their flu shots this year. So I really think it's important that we must acknowledge and leverage the important role of pharmacies and pharmacists in our broader public health system as we think about our public health response. And then finally, I wanna talk about, again, this has already been mentioned, but our need to overhaul our, our data system and our public health data infrastructure. So in the beginning of the COVID-19 response, and I remember being on site uh, at my state lab and watching samples come in and us putting them on machines, we literally had providers who had no capacity to test in their facilities, handwriting patient names and demographic information on, on lab samples and putting the slip in a bag and then shipping it, literally physically having to ship it to our state lab um, at the, in the Capitol. And then my state lab team, again, top in the country, had to manually input that often incomplete or inaccurate data information into our laboratory data system. And then there was no way to quickly get any results back to medical providers who were performing the test, let alone the actual patient. So similarly, uh, for understanding outbreaks in congregate settings in schools, we were using tools like SurveyMonkey and relying on school staff and local health departments who have, we've already known have been understaffed and underfunded for decades, we were relying on them to tell us what was happening in our communities. 
And, and the public, I'll say, and, and rightfully so, and, and quite frankly, I, as a public health official, wanted and expected better. But our infrastructure simply was not there to really be able to gain any uh, quick and robust understanding of how the virus was spreading. And this really resulted not only in more rapid spread, but also, and this is important, a lack of ability to identify where disparities existed. And so we really have to have a more robust data infrastructure and investment if we're going to address the public's health needs and appropriately address inequities. And so I, I certainly am optimistic. I'm honored to have served uh, this country uh, during COVID-19 and other public health responses. But I also want to emphasize that there is urgency to address the gaps that we are seeing in our public health system and also emphasize the importance of public and in private partnerships as we think about that. So thank you. Now I'll turn over back over to you, Rachel. Thank you so much, Joni. That was terrific. Um, Denise, um, you are next up. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, having me thanking, of course, the Alliance for Health Policy and all of the presenters. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes uh, with each of you talking about strengthening our public health system and the roles of community health workers. Uh, next slide, please. So just briefly, I want to um, not make any assumptions about folks' understanding of community health workers. So I'll take a moment and just lift up a definition which may be familiar to many of you. This comes from the American Public Health Association, um, which identifies community health workers under a, a large umbrella term, of course, as being uh, community health representatives from tribal nations, uh, promotores and promotores de salud, um, our outreach workers, peers, uh, those with lived experience. And from recent national data, we found uh, hundreds of other job titles wherein the CHW identity uh, can be found. Uh, we are known as frontline public health workers and those who have lived experience. And uh, you know, so we're seen as trusted uh, frontline public health members who help to liaise and to build bridges across a variety of different sectors impacting the quality and cultural competence of service delivery. Uh, what I would add to that definition, um, in my own experience, the last couple of decades of being a community health worker, as well as lifting up the voices and identities of many of my colleagues and peers, is that we are predominantly persons of color. We're predominantly women. Um, and across the globe, we share ethnicity, diagnosis, socioeconomic status, and geography with the communities where we live and serve we're disproportionately impacted by inequities. We often experience many of the same barriers to the social drivers of well-being um, and healthcare with other marginalized communities. And so we are unique uh, participants pursuing equity and system transformation and representing often both providers of service and patients or community member voices. Next slide, please. So, the National Association, which was launched in April 2019, and we just celebrated our third year uh, this April, um, has gotten together with uh, many of our colleagues across the country, including CHW's allies and our CHW networks, associations and coalitions to pull together um, what we call the six pillars of the profession. Um, and as you're reading here, just for time's sake, I won't uh, go so far into the document, but what we thought uh, was still missing from an awareness uh, nationally in terms of the conversation about CHW's roles and capacity in public health is to understand the history of our field, um, to understand that we um, are a diverse um, workforce, to understand that we are working already across a variety of different sectors. So outside of clinical, behavioral health, and social services, um, we are working in education. We are working in research and academic centers. Uh, we're working to address immigration and a number of sort of advocacy roles as well, um, as well as across all of the sort of chronic disease states that you would imagine. Um, we're a proven workforce with over six 
uh, decades of documented evidence of our effectiveness in a variety, again, of you know, HIV, maternal and child health, oral health, uh, et cetera. Um, but we remain a precarious workforce. And as I mentioned, being uh, mostly persons of color and mostly female, uh, we are among the lowest paid of all public health professionals. So I, I'm lifting up those uh, to add some context to some of the conversation um, that I, I hope we'll get a chance to have today in terms of CHW's roles to strengthen the public health profession. Next slide, please. Use a COVID-19 as an example. I, I could talk about a lot of um, different examples of CHWs, but this is obviously one um, that has touched every single uh, home, every single life, every single country um, on the planet. So uh, I'll just sort of run through a quick summary of the last sort of two years of CHW's um, roles and identity in COVID-19, CHW's experiences, our perspectives, and also the barriers that prevent sustainability in emergency or pandemic public health response and beyond. Um, so many are familiar that it did not take long um, for global leaders, uh, health providers, legislators, policymakers, funders to call for the rapid scale up and integration of community health workers into uh, this public health response. Um, many of you may recall that in March of 2020, the US Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency demonstrated the urgency to engage my profession in a pandemic when it issued guidance to all 50 states, tribes and territories that classified CHWs as essential critical infrastructure workers during COVID-19. Um, Nachwa contributed early on to uh, some of these discussions by uh, the graphics that you're seeing here. This one pager was really um, us building consensus across many global organizations, Partners in Health, Last Mile Health, um, and many organizations within the United States, like the Penn Center uh, Impact Program, um, Health Leads, Health Begins. Uh, I, I don't want to miss any of my partners. Uh, and we were really lifting up three ways to amplify a CHW's work during COVID-19. Um, in addition, uh, we tried to get out as early as we could with uh, a blog to clarify the the roles for chws to strengthen public health response because we were hearing from chws across the country working at hospitals and fqhcs and nonprofits. if you can recall those early months when many of these organizations were shutting down scaling down closing their sort of storefront um, and typical face-to-face -face engagements, many CHWs were being laid off and furloughed uh, because people did not see an essential critical role for them uh, in those early months. Next slide, please. So the next four or five slides are gonna go by really quickly, but what I wanna do is just sort of summarize for you at the highest level what CHWs have been doing during COVID-19. And, you know, I'm only regretting that I don't have time to give you more local uh, and diverse nuance here. So please accept these as high level examples. First, we were implementing uh, across our roles and competencies as, as widely endorsed in the CHW core consensus project. And if you're not familiar there, what I want to say is um, CHWs have come together with our allies across sector, across geography, ethnicity, and across the country um, to identify and clarify what are our unique unduplicated roles in public health and as members of an integrated care team. Um, and there are a number of different ways we were calling for people to partner with us, right? Whether they wanted us to conduct outreach on the front lines or to help with language translation, to conduct home visits, um, to help design and develop communication strategies, um, to help navigate people across uh, different services as folks were adapting uh, to COVID-19. But we were also saying that our profession needed to be protected during this time. And what I'll say here is that uh, many CHWs across the country who were not working in health centers or hospitals were not prioritized 
for the vaccine, if you can remember as far back as 1A and 1B. Um, that was critical for our ability to protect ourselves, to protect our family, and also to uh, fully engage in services in the community. Next slide, please. CHWs were also responding to the sharp rise in uh, AAPI hate. And here I'll just lift up that Nachwa partnered with a, a number of different hyper-local organizations across the country and across uh, Asian American Pacific Islander communities and populations to pull together ways in which all CHWs, regardless of geography, regardless of their ethnicity or sector, could support um, the Stop AAPI Hate Movement um, and ways in which we could just advance uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander voices and health systems during this time. Next slide. Of course, we were addressing a variety of uh, social drivers to well-being. Um, you know, here I'm just showing uh, a couple of CHWs in South Carolina delivering diapers um, and formula. Um, we were also continuing to help people to enroll in benefits and services um, when they were being uh, laid off. Next slide. We continue to maintain whatever our existing clinical public health or behavioral health services were under uh, the short-term grant programs or our employment uh, across uh, a variety of different systems and sectors. And here I'm just lifting up partnerships uh, that Nachwa had with the CDC uh, to help CHWs conduct home visits safely if that was in their scope of work and also the roles that we play as uh, first responders uh, in a partnership with the American Diabetes Association. Next slide, please. CHWs, uh, of course, in our everyday uh, activity before COVID, but certainly uh, once we began to understand the timeline um, and the readiness or lack thereof of communities to um, uh, exhibit vaccine acceptance and to be ready um, to actually go to a vaccine site or their provider to get vaccinated, that we had to um, be first responders around historic mistrust and dis, uh, misinformation and disinformation, uh, I can add here. Next slide, please. And CHWs, of course, were uh, called upon to help build capacity for an equitable uh, vaccine distribution infrastructure. Uh, one of the things that Nachwa did to support that work is to uh, co-found the Vaccine Equity Cooperative. And so here I'm just lifting up uh, our initial joint statement back in October 2020 on ensuring racial equity and the development and distribution of a COVID-19 vaccine. and then. Uh, we were uh, not not too there long uh, after uh, hosted a webinar with uh, Native American uh, community health representatives, promotorists, and others at the hyper-local level to talk about what some of those uh, emerging barriers were and how to overcome them. Next slide, please. So, you know, as I begin to close here, I, I want to just lift up uh, the next two slides. You know. The community of CHWs and our allies were really encouraged by um, the transition and the prioritization of uh, the Biden-Harris administration beginning, you know, right when the administration came in in January 2021, uh, that focused um, language and dollars um, around CHWs and our community-based organizations or our CHW-led organization. So here, what I'm just showing you are all of the different um, documents, um, plans, initiatives um, across the Biden administration that included uh, CHWs, both in the response uh, plan for COVID-19 and the preparedness plan that came out this year uh, throughout the health equity task force. Um, and across the major priorities, we were also uh, recognized um, and there was urgency around our inclusion and our sustainability. In the American Rescue Plan, real dollars began to flow and continue to flow uh, across the country through our state uh, tribes and territories. 
uh, and, and local health departments. And then of course, uh, this year we saw that in uh, the mental health uh, strategy that was released, once again, CHWs were identified. Next slide, please. Um, however, respect and sustainability barriers continue to persist. Um, this is not a new story for those of you who know the CHW workforce, um, but specific again, and through the lens of COVID-19, what I wanna say is um, despite, you know, not only our blog, but calls across the country and through uh, numerous experts to integrate community health workers, we found that uh, our leadership voice and our capacity uh, even our 10 core roles as widely endorsed across the country were not really being um, evidenced and included in funding opportunities and interventions. We saw that our community-based organizations, the majority of which where CHWs operate, the majority of us are not employed uh, in hospitals or FQHCs, but our CBOs were not getting funding and that, you know, there were some structural problems um, to the way that the funding historically flows. Um, as some of those are uh, just systemic inequities that have never truly been addressed. Uh, specifically, you know, CNN Health had uh, a really great story about uh, some of uh, the community-based partnerships around the country with uh, vaccine clinical trial initiatives and uh, the challenges of engaging community based organizations, promotoras and CHWs, uh, and getting real dollars to flow and real respect in authentic partnership. Um, I had an opportunity to write a blog uh, for USA Today, just really reflecting on the impact uh, of being on the front line and watching so many people who were disproportionately impacted in marginalized communities uh, die or become hospitalized uh, from COVID-19 um, and CHWs really having uh, mental health challenges without having great access to mental health supports. And then finally, uh, you know, in March of this year, Kaiser uh, Health News wrote a really important story uh, around uh, a group of 400 CHWs in Chicago um, who had been hired just a few months earlier, uh, whose six month funding grant was already running out. And so while they were on the front lines building trust uh, and helping people to uh, traverse barriers so that they could protect themselves, their families, their communities, their places of work. These 400 CHWs, almost as quickly as they were hired, um, were being laid off. Next slide, please. So, you know, in summary, uh, to strengthen uh, public health, CHWs have a critical, uh, unique, unduplicated role uh, we are a proven workforce. We are a diverse workforce. And I think you've heard before, but I'll just reiterate, uh, in the uh, De Beaumont Foundation PH Wins uh, National uh, Survey that they conduct every couple of years, um, they have uh, confirmed that we have an aging public health workforce, that we have a mostly white, uh, mostly female public health workforce, um, that we need to uh, diversify the skill set of our public health workforce that we need uh, more strategy and understanding on authentic community engagement. And so for a variety of reasons, there are career pathways that uh, should be uh, developed that include uh, this CHW workforce. Next slide. So we think that community health workers are the workforce that we need for the world that we want to address growing US public health worker shortages, weakness and pandemic readiness, particularly at the community level, to help reduce cost and disease by prioritizing the social drivers of health and well-being, and to achieve racial and health equity for marginalized communities. Next slide, and I, I think that's my final as I wrap up. So to ensure CHW sustainability during COVID and beyond, there are certain opportunities that exist right now. And so wherever you are in your sphere of influence, I would um, point you to both uh, the CDC 2103 and 2109 uh, funding streams. The 2103 is in all 50 state uh, health departments. The 2109 is varied across more local uh, territories and some states. And then the $3.9 billion funding announcement 
uh, that you know those dollars will be coming uh, soon around strengthening the public health infrastructure, including a number of HRSA uh, training and technical assistance NOPOs, as well as uh, current activity in the House and Senate around amendments to the Public Health Service Act. There are a variety of opportunities and level of policy and advocacy engagement to elevate CHW voices. So we think that adopting CHW definitions that do not exist in dozens of states and do not exist at the federal level that center our history, our identity, and our self-determination are critical. We think we need to align CHW funding uh, roles, scope, recruitment, training, supervision, career ladders, and leadership uh, to those that have been summarized in the NACHWA national policy platform. And what I want to say here is our, our national policy platform is an aggregate of policies and uh, practices across several decades, including APHA, and, uh, but they are developed and endorsed by uh, our members and, of course, uh, CHWs and allies across the country. We also think it's really important to advance uh, CHW leadership and capacity and the National Association, as well as many CHW networks and associations in your states and counties, look forward to partnering with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Denise. That was really a tour de force and a really, really important set of um, uh, findings, observations, and recommendations. So thank you for that. And thank you for the work that you've been doing on the front lines um, all throughout this pandemic. Um, Dr. Bazemore, I'm going to turn it over to you for um, the final set of formal comments. No, oh, thank you, Wendy. And Thanks to the Commonwealth Foundation and the Alliance for convening the event. It is incredibly important and I'm a little daunted to follow such an excellent group of talks, but we'll try to do a little bit of joining here. Um, I am a practicing family physician. I'm also uh, proudly a public health practitioner with a long um, a bit of experience, particularly in global settings and seeing where that primary care and public health uh, interface comes together. And, you know, I think, We've heard enough to say that uh, pandemic brought out some of the uh, the best and the worst in American healthcare. It's obvious that it's exposed some really long-standing weaknesses in the system, and this despite the fact that we are the wealthiest nation on the planet with the largest total and proportional investments in health and healthcare, um, and even scoring very well on two different prominent indices of pandemic and epidemic preparedness, uh, the EPI and the Global Health Security Index. The correlation with actual performance, I think, is uh, has been stated many times. Um, we had a mortality both rate and total that were not in any way exemplary of preparedness for this pandemic. And I think there have been many questions about why. And I'll go to the next slide and just say, since we're in a, a Commonwealth uh, a report environment here as well, I wanted to bring up two previous Commonwealth reports that point out fairly obviously that among peer nations, we perform very poorly in our overall addressing of quality, effectiveness, and uh, efficacy. And as been pointed out by two previous speakers, we remain a terribly and equitable deliverer of health through our expenses uh, put out on healthcare. And I would say that one of the many reasons for this is a chronic inattention and underfunding to public health and primary care. If you look at our ecologies, as demonstrated first by Carl White, and twice in prominent articles uh, in the 60 years since, we are proportionally dedicating an abysmally small amount of that total health spend to primary care and public health. And speaking from my uh, experience in frontline primary care, uh, when things began to fall apart in the early days of pandemic, that disconnect became abundantly apparent. Next slide. But in any crisis, and certainly in the debriefing, there's opportunity. And I am enjoying seeing from leading CDC authorities in the health policy uh, paper on the upper left uh, to others writing about uh, primary care authorities that this is really an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do something different. It's an opportunity to think of public health and primary care in a different lens and to change that investment. And I'll go to the next slide. The good news as well is we have a blueprint. We have been writing about public health and primary care as integrated and inseparable entities for many, many years. In a 1967 Blue Ribbon Panel report called the Wholesome Commission, uh, Health as Community Fair began to point out that community solutions are really born from the ground up. 
really enjoyed hearing Denise talk about the critical role of community health workers and the vision that this paints is of a, a community that includes clinicians, frontline health knowledgeable workers from the community and community members themselves. And they really start to talk about uh, integration in the way that the global framework at the Declaration of Alma-Ata, where every nation on earth said primary health care is not delivered in a box in a fee-for-service environment by one clinician, it's essential health care. And it's based on practical, scientifically sound, socially acceptable methods that are universally accessible and that involve full participation of a community at a cost that's affordable to them. We'll go on to the next slide. We have evidence and action stemming from a terrible period in South Africa of apartheid, but where Sydney and Emily Kark, with far less resources, were able to demonstrate the power of a combined public health primary care authority, moving outside of that clinical box, working in community settings to attach pro to address problems identified by the community and addressed in combination with the community, picked up and carried into our own FQHCs or federally qualified health center network started by the two individuals on the bottom right in Mississippi and Boston who initiated the first community health centers, which now number over 14,000, require a participation in their boards, their governing bodies of 51% community members, and you can advance one, and operate on a model, a circular model that says the task of this team is to define and characterize communities, identify problems, develop interventions, and monitor them with constant and perpetual cyclical involvement of the community along the way. This is the vision of primary health care and public health going forward hand in hand. Next slide. Heard that we are lacking in an informatic infrastructure to support this kind of development. I'll tell you that we have been writing and thinking for years about how you can take public health records and primary care clinical data and bring them together in an interface and perpetually daunted by the underfunding of informatics infrastructure in primary care and public health settings by the perpetual lack of interface or interoperability of that information. When I need to understand, you can click one more, really what the community vital signs are for my team to address patients and their lives and to really understand what's my catchment area, not just folks walking through the door, but about the population that I should be addressing. I don't have the informatics, the digital infrastructure to help me do so. We need community vital signs sitting right next to our blood pressures, our, again, respiratory rates and our temperatures and our charts. And we need to be working upstream as teams together with public health professionals to address these issues. Slide, it became readily apparent that those um, framing features of the 1967 Folsom report were lacking. I'll go to the next slide if that's okay. The conceptual model that they brought forth about communities of solution were pointing out the, the really lacking nature of addressing problems strictly along governmental or political uh, lines. What they pointed out was that communities of solutions that are trying to address what they called problem sheds, somewhat like our watersheds, cross those lines. And it was insufficient to have merely federal or state or county or city government addressing a problem. You had to have partnerships. Denise mentioned community health workers, part of a broader primary team, primary care teams, teachers are involved, uh, the police are involved. And if we're gonna take on these problems, and I'll point to vaccinations in a moment, uh, we have to bring these together. I think the pandemic really brought out uh, the separateness of these two perpetually underfunded enterprises, public health, primary care communities. And we have an opportunity whether we're dealing with better vaccination campaigns. I won't reiterate, sorry, reiterate all that was said by the previous speakers about the shortcomings of our vaccine distribution. But if we're gonna accomplish the task of getting prevention and oral health and vaccination distribution to happen effectively and particularly in an equitable fashion, we're gonna have to bring these together. Slide to take a slightly deeper dive in the vaccine response, we have to acknowledge that nearly six in 10 routine vaccines are administered in these primary care offices. I think you've heard several times over that between the community health workers and the primary care teams, there is more trust than is in any other sector and far greater trust than any community members or patients have in federal or state responses. We have to get the teams involved at the ground level. We're seeing an increasing tendency to integrate primary care offices and larger organizations and systems. We're seeing the birth of chief population or public health officers in these systems. 
we have to get away from service line healthcare thinking and think about integrated delivery and figure out in our pandemic preparedness and planning how we can incorporate primary care and public health together at the beginning of the pandemic. It was obvious that cold chain was gonna be a barrier to getting COVID vaccines into primary care offices early, but the real tragedy is that later in the year 2021, we still found our primary care teams woefully undersupplied with vaccines when they had identified and through trusting relationships built trust in vaccine delivery for the populations that needed them the most. It was fairly easy to get them in the suburbs and a little harder in rural and underserved urban areas. Again, we need digital and data infrastructure investments. We need a shared vaccine registry and ways to link these clinical data and population health data in one place so that we can allow the primary care teams to identify those in greatest needs and partner with public health agents that are uh, helping to strategize over where we distribute vaccines. Next slide. Just wanted to wrap up given the important Commonwealth report that was the nidus of this conversation with a note uh, and a few thoughts on public health primary care integration coming out of this. It's abundantly clear, and this is a quote from the report, that the healthcare system must be a vital partner of the public health system. Progress requires data sharing, engagement of the workforce, and establishing expectations really from the get-go. This is what I'm trying to highlight more than anything. If we can bring the primary care infrastructure and public health infrastructure together, better fund each, we have a real chance to do better in the next pandemic. Slide. Maintain trust. We need to have communities in it as integral partners in public health efforts. Build these monthly sector partnerships to address drivers of health. Address misinformation. And I've already mentioned a source of trust. These PHC, primary health care or public health primary care teams is a part of an expanded communications program and prioritize ethics and integrity. And that really means strategic ethics and integrity in our decision making. Final slide. I would note that the Common Health Report also calls for a reconvening of the National Prevention and Public Health Council. The recent high performing primary care report from the National Academies of Medicine calls for the creation of a first ever Secretary's Council for Primary Care. I think there's real opportunity here at the Secretary's level to integrate these efforts and do better in our next uh, preparedness for pandemic. Data sharing, we absolutely, to quote that from the report, will have to invest in the digital infrastructure I've mentioned. And when we talk about an engaged workforce, again, I will double down and, uh, and highlight Denise's call for more promotores, patient navigators, community health workers that are integrated in multi-partner primary health care teams. We need better training, training uh, dollars not only for siloed training, but for team-based training and better engagement. Finally, calls for expectations. We are going to have to change our payment model to accommodate social risks better and incentivize the primary care teams that are currently still predominantly paid on fee-for-service to be not only identifying, but addressing social determinants of health and coordinating with public health along the way. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Bazemore. Um, I, that was terrific. I'd like to ask all of the panelists to put themselves back on video, back on camera for um, the Q&A session. Um, once again, thanks to all of our panelists. It was a terrific conversation. We could keep going all day. Um, I'm happy to do that if, if folks want to stay on. Um, we've got a few minutes um, and have a number of questions from the audience. Um, I thought maybe we could start and have a number of you address the intersection between the need to um, strengthen the public health infrastructure with um, building or rebuilding community trust. At first glance, it might seem that they're two totally different priorities, but all of you have touched on the fact that um, we need to be investing in the right people to develop, to develop the messages, to deliver the messages, um, right now, it's not clear kind of what the future of COVID funding um, looks like um, right now as we're gearing up for um, a vaccination campaign. Um, we had an audience member write in that they are a survivor of polio um, in the early 50s, and they still cannot wrap their heads around how people are not taking vaccines seriously, given all of the evidence and the science we have about vaccines. So, what can we, how do we start? Where do we start? Is it focusing on the infrastructure? Is it building that community trust so that we really can help bring a public demand, you know, for more um, public health dollars? Um, but how do we kind of get at these two seemingly intractable issues of, you know, an infrastructure that's been 
really neglected, I think, for decades. I heard a lot of agreement on that, um, as well as you know, figuring out how we can su successfully partner um, with those um, trusted messengers um, in each of the communities. I know that's a lot, but we have a lot of questions and not a lot of time. So I wanted to try to weave them together. So um, does anyone want to start with that one? I, I can jump in. Um, you know, I, I think, again, having spent a lot of time at the state and local level, I think I think we have to do both, right? We have to build the data infrastructure, make sure I'd say we also have diversity of leadership at the local, state, and national level in public health positions. And diversity means uh, different lived experiences. Uh, that's across demographic factors. It's racial, ethnic diversity, but it's also LGBTQIA. Um, it's also disability status. And it's also making sure that as public health leaders, and I, I tried to do this, I always would say I could, I could do better, but we have to get out of our offices, right? The fact that no one before COVID-19, I shouldn't say no one, but a lot of people in the general public had no idea that there was a local health department or what they did or God forbid, like who they actually were until they started seeing them on TV, some random person telling them what to do. And so it's really important that as public health leaders, we get out of our offices, that we are also introducing ourselves not only to uh, trusted community members, building those partnerships before the crisis hits, uh, but that we're also building partnerships again, multi-sector partnerships, going to businesses and engaging with employers and schools, et cetera. We should have been doing that well before COVID-19. I think we would have had a better response if we had. You know, I'm impressed looking at the studies and the polls. When you ask people, who do you trust to give you information on health, particularly around vaccination? As Dr. Bazemore mentioned, it's always one's own local doctor or nurse or health professional. And I wonder if Dr. Bazemore wants to say more. Have we, have we supported the primary care professionals enough and paid them for their time so they can dedicate their efforts to talking about this with their patients? or if we just overlook that because poll after poll shows that same result. They don't particularly trust national leaders or even state leaders, but it's the local professional that they're seeing, uh, their doctor, their nurse, that really makes a difference. Howard, thank you. I'm grateful for the question and, and would say it's, um, the answer is no, but it's nuanced as I hope I presented. I, I am not, and I speak as a primary care clinician, um, that it's investing just in the office in the current payment model that's the problem. It's investing in primary care as a function that involves the community agents that we've mentioned and that Denise highlighted. And it's creating a, a funding mechanism that really builds up, lifts up primary care and public health uh, and recognizes, as, as I think Jenna noted, that, that that is a source of existing trust. I have seen so much good done with so much less investment in other countries, and it makes me very sad. And it usually starts with a sensibility and you know a team-based, community-based sensibility that we are here to perform a function for a person and a population. And right now we are terribly fragmented. So it's both underinvestment and absence of attention to de-siloing and bringing together the, the clinical base of, of that primary care team. I think the only thing I'll add to the last two comments is that um, everyone doesn't have a primary care provider, right? And everyone does not have access um, due to literacy and finances and transportation, et cetera. So that is why the infrastructure and the capacity conversations have to be uh, integrated. Um, that's also why I think um, it is past time for us to set aside conversations of health equity um, as sort of an independent theoretical concept and we need to move from, uh, you know, our mission statements to collective action uh, to eradicate some of the barriers to the excellent work and services, right, that people cannot connect to. Thanks to all of you um, for that. Um, Erica and Denise, maybe I'll have you start on this one. Um, Dr. Ko brought up 9-11 and anthrax and, you know, kind of refreshed our memory on, you know, um, crises that have happened in the past. And I, I think 
we don't do a good job as a as a nation kind of reflecting on lessons learned and applying those going forward on the um on the the more recent examples with covid and kind of building building the partnerships and community based organizations um the early days of the hiv aids epidemic really kind of came to mind and you see a lot of similarities in how when the federal government decided to, decided to start funding the funding was very very specific and it you know took a lot of kind of maneuvering for community based organizations um, to to engage and then it was really hard for those efforts to be sustained when federal attention went other places um, we had a number of conversations about you know how how can you sustain those partnerships in communities long term again that both helps build our infrastructure but also address some trust because it's hard to get people to trust you to your point Denise when you said you know they just maybe established a relationship with a community health worker and now the funding for the community health worker is gone and maybe that person's not um, going to be able to return but Erica and Denise, would you talk a little bit about are there examples from from that from that time or perhaps other you know health um, uh, public health emergencies that we can really look to and really start to um, you know just repeat some of these lessons until um, they they're solidified in our collective memory so that we don't have to keep relearning them. Sure, I can start. So I'm glad you brought up this question that HIV is one of the topics. So I actually think that that's a lesson in, what, in some of the things that we did well. So there are certainly some really challenges in the early days. But um, with the Ryan White Care Act, what happened was that there was this, this stream of funding that went for Ryan White clinics that were specifically for people living with HIV, and they took a very holistic approach. And so for a long time in HIV, we have been thinking in terms of systems of care. We've been thinking in terms of the social determinants of health. We've been thinking in terms of, you know, integrating um, health services with transportation needs, with other wraparound services, social services. And we haven't yet always gotten to that point with other disease areas. But also reflecting on it, the problem is this funding is only for HIV. <laughs> so when you, there are a lot more people who, um, are at risk for STIs or viral hepatitis than HIV, and yet HIV gets the most funding. And so I think that's sort of one of the, the challenges that I hope we can fix is this siloed approach to funding. But I think we can learn a lot from how we thought through um, HIV and thinking through it in a more holistic manner. Yeah, thanks, Erica. I also thought Rachel was gonna go the other way. Um, so I worked in Ryan White Part A and Part B programs here in Hartford, Connecticut, um, as an HIV outreach early intervention specialist. Um, so doing rapid testing on, on the street. And uh, so let me just say, I think many things worked well, right? I think that, um, it, you know, for, I worked at an AHEC at the time, uh, but our catchment area had high rates of uh, HIV. And so we were uh, conducting triage for the entire county. Uh, of 27 states. Uh, we sat on the Ryan White uh, Part A Consortium, which had a multi-sector team uh, coming together, thinking about the funding and how the funding should be distributed and making sure we included housing and uh, you know, KDAP, uh, health insurance uh, for persons living with HIV, as well as primary care, behavioral health. So a range of services there. Uh, I worked off of a mobile health care van with a APRN and an LPN so that I could do street outreach anywhere and have a safe place to do brief counseling and testing. And I also worked on an integrated care team with social workers and primary care docs so, and pharmacists. So I think that we have many lessons that we can learn um, from why, uh, Ryan White uh, programs in this time. I absolutely agree with both of you. I also worked in that space. But I guess my question is, why are why have we not captured those lessons, you know, of how that was successfully done and applied them to to COVID-19? Like it was the first time, you know, we had to develop um, community partnerships or think about um, transportation and housing and, and food insecurity. I think that that's the, that was the really the spirit of the question is is there a way we can 
you know, continue to build and learn from those experiences and, you know, just get smarter and, and better each time. Yeah, I'll just lift up two reasons I think we don't. Uh, so thank you to your more pointed follow-up. Um, the first is um, let's look at who is disproportionately impact by, impacted by HIV AIDS. Okay, those communities who are disproportionately impacted have less voice in all spheres, whether we're talking about political or civic voice, or whether we're talking about decision-making voice. Um, you know, just to talk about what interventions are working, how they're working, and where they should be implemented. The other yeah. is we don't do a good job of funding community-based organizations, and I mentioned that earlier. Um, the reason that Nachwa uh, co-founded the Community-Based Workforce Alliance and the Vaccine Equity Cooperative is because we understood that there was going to be a clinical response to the pandemic. We knew that there was going to be a public health response to the pandemic, and we can talk about um, all of the needs there, whether we're talking about respirators or public health communicators, epidemiologists, but what we did not have, what we weren't prepared for, was developing a robust community-based infrastructure to tie in to the other two. I, I didn't mm -hmm. mention mental health as well. We have a rising pandemic, but I think those are some of the reasons why um, and, and it is a concern, you know, we did this again for the Affordable Care Act. We built a robust infrastructure, a technology yeah. infrastructure, a funding infrastructure, communication infrastructure, outreach infrastructure. And then when states began to do well, we pulled back the funding, right? Yeah. So there are lots of things that we have to sustain so that we can achieve better health for individuals, families, and communities. But I just don't think we've invested in that yet. Yeah. Yeah, agree. Thank you so much. Dr. Ko, yeah, um, I don't want to... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Erica. Uh, I was going to say, Denise, those are great points. And I think two things that I would add to that is the advocacy. So in the early days, so absolutely, Denise is correct. I mean, um, persons living with HIV are traditionally vulnerable populations, but in the early days of HIV epidemic, it was also different because we also had strong advocacy from LGBT groups. Um, and that has not really happened for uh, diseases like viral hepatitis, which is disproportionately in, um, impacting persons who inject drugs. Um, and the other thing I think that hasn't yet been touched on as much during this uh, panel is the politicization of public health right now. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not really sure what to do about that, um, but I would say that this is why we need to have clear data, why we need to be putting out transparent data um, so that hasn't always been done. Um, and also been really clear in our communication and messaging. And, you know, those are like some strategies that we can try to take. Thanks, Erica. Um, I, I cannot believe how fast the time has gone. We are almost out of time. I want to make sure everyone has time to make a final closing comment. I was going to go to you, Dr. Ko. So I'm going to turn it over to you first and um, let you make any final comments. Well, thank you very much for this panel. Our really excellent presentations and discussion. The, the key issue here, and it's been said over and over, is can we be serious about sustaining disease prevention and preparedness going forward? Or are we just going to sit back and let this happen again? My great fear is we are seeing attention starting to be diverted elsewhere uh, until the next threat comes. Then everybody asks yet again, how come we weren't prepared? So. This is our moment. Uh, I think one more thing I want to add, which hasn't been mentioned here, we, we can have plans with great scores, as uh, Dr. Bazemore mentioned at the beginning of his talk, but we're not going to really know unless we test the system with drills and exercises. And I, and I think that keeps the, the threat concerns front and center in front of people uh, day in and day out. And I think we, should, we need more attention to that going forward uh, if we're going to be really ready for the next crisis. Thank you. Um, Andrew? Thank you, Rachel. Um, well, since the rest of the panel has said it so much better, I'll just echo everything I've heard. We are lacking a current financing model for appropriate funding of public health. That's the, the beginning and primary care. But more importantly, bringing those two together under one roof does not mean more boxes in a healthcare system. It means working at the level that Denise mentions and really engaging and growing out a workforce inclusive of community agents and agents that are bridges between the healthcare system 
and the front line. I completely agree with Howard. We plan usually around isolated diseases or incidents. HIV was a long lasting epidemic pandemic, um, anthrax perhaps a shorter one, and that sort of isolated planning is our doom. And we have the best laid plan for the next single disease. We have to have something that is a sustainable infrastructure ready for a diverse array of threats that come our way. And that's the only way that we're going to strengthen and modernize and perpetuate a public health care system. That we Great, thank you. Danae? Absolutely. You know, I, I echo what, what my colleagues have said. I also add, when we talk about preparedness and planning and all of our tabletop exercises, they often, and I've led several of them, they often only include other kind of public health, emergency preparedness, governmental people. And I think we have to think more broadly about engaging um, other sectors. Uh, again, not when the pandemic's already here, but on an ongoing basis so that we're prepared. And then I'd also add, it is not a surprise. The data that we saw, Michigan was one of the first states to uh, release race and ethnicity data on COVID-19. Uh, that's because my epidemiologist knew that I wasn't going to be putting out any data unless we at a minimum did that. I tried to get LGBTQ, disability, et cetera. We have to stop leaving historically marginalized communities behind. And that means leveraging primary care, leveraging community-based organizations, leveraging strategically partnering with community health workers. And again, not when the crisis hits. So partnerships, 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 so important. Thank you so much. Denise? Yeah, I'll just say what's on the, uh, the picture behind me with uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, it's left to us. You know, this is an example of, uh, you know, how quickly we can come to consensus across many different communities right now on this call. Um, and I think uh, what we need to do is we need to turn those strategies and our relative assets um, and urgency into collective action. Um, we're not out of anything. We're still in COVID. We're waiting for flu season. We're within monkeypox and we have many other uh, you know, and HIV and a mental health crisis. We have wicked problems uh, that are not solved in silos um, and that are not short term. So I look forward to working with diverse communities. Thank you. Thank you. And Erica. It's hard to go last because I agree with all the points. I think I would just really reemphasize that we really need to rethink our funding model. Um, we need sustainable funding that's not tied to threats or disease silos. Um, we talked a lot about problems of workforce, leadership, community partnership, equity, data infrastructure, but we're not gonna solve any of those problems unless we have stable and sustainable funding. Great, thank you again to all of you. And thanks for everyone in our audience for staying with us. We went a few minutes over. We appreciate that you're still here, finishing on this really important conversation with us. Please take time to complete the brief evaluation survey that you will receive immediately after the broadcast ends. Keep an eye on the Alliance's website for details about future events, and know that a recording of this, is, along with the additional materials, will be available on the Alliance website. This concludes our event for today. Thank you so much to Andrew, Janae, Denise, Howard, Erica. It was really a pleasure to spend this um, time with you all. Um, please keep up the hard work. Thank you for everything that you've been doing. and. Thank you again to the Alliance team. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.